ladies and gentlemen, good morning to everybody. As co-director of this course, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Maris Cremona, who will talk uh, to us about the constitutional foundations of the European Union of External Relations, which is at present one of uh, her main fields of uh, research. Um, as you all know her, uh, I don't think it, that it is appropriate to spend time highlighting her main publications or going over uh, her most relevant academic achievements. Uh, suffice it to say uh, that she is professor in the law department of uh, the European University Institute in Florence, uh, where she has served also as president uh, until last September. Uh, that she is co-director of the Academy of European Law and general editor of the collective courses of the Academy of European Law. Uh, Maris Cremona is also a member of the advisory board or the editorial board of uh, some of the most relevant European law reviews. But I, I should stop here um, uh, to leave as much time as possible for her speech and uh, to the following discussion. Uh, let, let me just add, in my condition of member of the executive board of the European Society of International Law, that uh, we are especially grateful to Maurice Cremona for having agreed to deliver an essay lecture, the European Society of International Law Lecture. So for those of you taking notes, uh, do not feel frustrated <laughs> if you miss uh, something, as in one week, more or less approximately in one week, you will be able to watch this lecture again on the YouTube channel of the European Society of International Law. Uh, thank you very much, Maurice. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to, uh, to all the organisers of, uh, of this conference for inviting me, and, and congratulations for putting together uh, such an interesting programme with uh, bringing together really uh, a very large number, almost, almost anyone that, uh, everyone that one could think of uh, who has uh, something interesting to say about EU external relations law at the moment. So I, I'm really looking forward to the next uh, couple of days. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, was asked to talk about the constitutional foundations of EU external relations and I'm, I'm going to focus on the question of, uh, of competence, which uh, those of you who know me will not be perhaps totally surprised. Um, the legal personality of the European Union indicates its legal capacity as an international organization to enter into international obligations. However, this leaves open the question of the extent and nature of the EU's external competence in specific fields, mm -hmm. which is derived directly and indirectly from the treaties. If we consider allocation of competence in EU practice in the external relations field, there are two dimensions that I want to consider today. First is the issue common to all policy fields, that of the relation between EU competence and member state competence, the extent to which and the circumstances under which one, one might displace or constrain the other. In uh, the ex context of external relations, this common theme is complicated both by the involvement of third countries and the fact that the member states retain their sovereignty and international capacity alongside the EU's international legal personality and its attributed and therefore limited external powers. The second dimension, which is, uh, I think, peculiar to external relations, and which is, but which is also faced by federal states, is the relationship between internal and external powers. To what extent is the external power of the EU dependent on possessing or exercising internal competence? Can the EU enter into international obligations which must then be implemented by the member states. To what extent are external powers tied to the achievement of internal union objectives? Is the division of competence between the EU and its member states to act internally mirrored in the division of competence to act externally? This last expression of the question makes clear the link between the two dimensions that um, I'm considering today. I want to start by recalling two rather different perspectives on these questions. The first is that of Joseph Weiler, now my colleague, of course, at the EUI. In his article on mixity in the federal principle, external legal relations of non-unitary actors, 
um, which was first published in 1983 uh, in the book edited by Henry Skirmers and David O'Keefe on mixed agreements, uh, and then republished in, in 99. Lila distinguishes between internal legislative competence and external treaty making powers, and he adds to these the question of in international capacity defined by him as acceptance by the international legal order of the polity's capacity to act. He addresses the nature of the EU as an external actor, as neither a federal state nor a classic international organization in fields of activity where competence is shared between the EU and its member states. He argues that whereas federal states generally adopt a principle based on unity in external action, in the sense of only one actor, this is not an inevitable result for other types of federal non-unitary systems. In fact, the mixed agreement, he argues, should be seen not as a necessary and perhaps temporary evil, but as an inventive and creative way of dealing with this problem, a true federal principle allowing the EU to participate in fields where it does not yet act internally, and even where it may not have competence internally. The second perspective is Robert Post's analysis of the Erta and Open Skies cases in Loic Azoulay and Miguel Poirier Maduro's The Past and Future of EU Law, published in 2010. Post writes of the difference between internal and external politics from the perspective of the needs of a polity. He defines internal politics as the creation of a political space that allows for the emergence of common commitments through the engagement of a plurality of actors in a process founded on trust and reciprocity. External politics, in contrast, is based on the expression of collective unity, enabling the polity to act in an outside world that may lack trust and reciprocity. He argues that there is a need to safeguard internal political discourse with its reliance on mutual trust, the internal agora, as he terms it, through unified external action. In AETR, the court appreciated this need for external unity in order to safeguard the internal legislative process. The court basing exclusive external competence on the existence of internal rules and their preemptive effect. Thus, unity of international representation is linked in this view with internal action and debate. On the one hand, external unity safeguards the internal policy space. On the other hand, the trust and reciprocity that emerge in the formation of a specific internal policy provide the basis for the transfer of powers, preemption, necessary to achieve external unity. These approaches seem to be rather different, both in their approach to unity and the way they regard the relation between internal and external powers in the perspective of the principle of conferral. In Viola's perspective, if we accept that the EU may be a non-unitary external actor, the scope of its internal and external powers need not necessarily be coterminous. For post, the operation of internal politics both calls for and facilitates external unity. But both of them reject a simple parallelism between internal and external powers in determining the division of competences between the EU and its member states. And both, I think, can help us understand different aspects of the EU's approach to mixed external competences. It's possible to see an evolution in thinking, including the thinking of the Court of Justice, about EC and then EU external competence, an evolution which is not so much a matter of moving from one conception of competence to another, but rather of adding new perspectives to the two dimensions we're considering here that of unity and the EU member state relation, and that of conferral and the internal-external relation. The original Treaty of Rome, as, as we all know, contained only two express external competences, the Common Commercial Policy, which the Court of Justice held to be exclusive in Opinion 175, and the power to conclude association agreements. The exclusivity of the Common Commercial Policy is not dependent on any act of the EU. It was, and still is, an a priori or constitutional exclusivity based on the need for unity and the effective defense of the common interest. Association agreements, the court held in Demirel, could cover the whole field of application of the treaty, despite the fact that in some fields, internal competence had not yet been exercised. <laughs> 
An association agreement concluded by the community may in part be implemented by its member states. Thus, in the case of these original express external powers, both the requirement of unity and the scope of external competence were disassociated from the existence of internal rules. The doctrine of implied external powers developed in the AETR line of cases dealt creatively and constructively with the dilemma of reconciling the principle of conferred powers with the need to provide a dynamic organization with the necessary tools to match its internal development with a growing international presence. The dilemma still remains, presenting itself in different ways. This doctrine was based on a different logic the existence of internal powers for identified EU objectives implies the possibility of unified external action by the Union where needed to achieve those objectives. Thus, implied external competence is closely linked to internal powers and internal objectives. Nonetheless, the approach to both express and implied competence was based on conceptions of effectiveness and unity. And in the initial cases, the court assumes that unity requires a transfer of competence and therefore exclusivity. In its reasoning on the exclusivity of implied powers, the court in AETR used the arguments that it was to use a few years later in Opinion 175 in the context of the common commercial policy, defense of the common interest of the EU and the need to protect the internal acquis, including free movement and undistorted competition. It was therefore in this phase that the conceptions of a priori exclusivity as for the common commercial policy and preemption as in AETR were worked out. The conditions under which the member states no longer have the power under EU law to act externally. And in this initial phase, external competence was perceived as a zero sum game in which either the EU or the member states are competent. Internal powers might justify the use of external instruments even when not expressly foreseen in the treaty if the development of an internal acquis demands an external unity. Shared external powers were seen as a temporary measure applying only until the EU had legislated. However, over the years between the 1970s and the Lisbon Treaty, exclusivity came to be seen as the exception rather than the rule for external relations. Only one other type of a priori exclusive competence, not dependent on legislative preemption, was discovered by the court in 1981, fisheries conservation, in the context of the common fisheries policy. A number of factors both expanded the scope for shared competence and altered the perception of shared competence as a temporary expedient. From the single European Act onwards, new express external powers were included in the treaty including new explicit fields of EU competence, such as environmental policy, development cooperation. And these new external competences have almost always been explicitly shared. And different types of shared competence came to be accepted. Although shared competence in general is subject to preemption, some of the new shared external competences do not preempt member state action. For example, um, the fields of development cooperation and humanitarian assistance, as well as, of course, the common foreign security policy. These are parallel competences in the sense that EU action does not prevent the member states from acting and both the EU and the member states may, may act alone. What are the relationship between internal action and external competences? As we have seen, AETR established the concept of preemption. It is the exercise of EU competence which precludes the member states from continuing to exercise their competence, sometimes referred to as the AETR effect. The member states, subject to the substantive and procedural obligations flowing from the primacy of EU law and the duty of sincere cooperation, may act as long as the EU has not done so. The exercise of competence by the EU which triggers preemption is generally le legislative. Um, i.e. based on the adoption of internal legislation. But preemption may also occur, even the, in the absence of internal legislation, by a decision on the part of the EU to exercise its competence to act externally, for example, by concluding an international agreement. This is much less common. Indeed, the member states, as draft drafters of the treaties, have been concerned to limit the possibility of what has been termed a reverse AETR effect, the possibility of an external agreement operating preemptively to turn a previously shared internal competence exclusive. 
The rationale of effectiveness as the basis of preemption in the context of EU external relations was summarized in 2003 by the Court of Justice. It, this is in opinion uh, 103. It is essential to ensure a uniform and consistent application of community rules and the proper functioning of the system which they established in order to preserve the full effectiveness of community law. However, by 2003, it had become accepted that it was, is not enough simply to identify the existence of union rules in a particular field to trigger the operation of preemption. The nature as well as the operation of those rules and even their possible future development will be relevant in order to ascertain whether individual member state action would affect the proper functioning of the system and the effectiveness of union law. So on the one hand, whereas in AETR the court refers to common rules adopted in the implementation of a common policy, later cases accepted that common rules may exist outside the framework of a common policy and also that preemption may apply to a field covered not completely but to a large extent by common rules. On the other hand, the evolution in internal legislation towards minimum harmonisation, which followed the Single European Act, put into question earlier assumptions that any community legislation could preempt member state activity. Hence the need for the court to engage in a sometimes detailed examination of both an agreement and the internal EU acquis before deciding whether or not preemption applies. So how do the post-Lisbon treaties reflect this evolution of thinking about external competence? We should say first that external policy is much more visible in the revised treaties. They contain specific provisions on external action, Title V of the TEU and Part V of the TFEU, which identify specifically external policies and powers, such as the CFSP, Common Commercial Policy, Development Cooperation, as well as general and procedural provisions and a set of specific external objectives is gathered together. Second, although the provisions on external action might be among those where a comparatively large number of revisions were made, these are intended to incorporate and consolidate past practice and to codify the case law of the court. The general enumeration of exclusive shared and complementary competences in the TFEU includes external powers and we can find examples of each type among the external policy powers following the categorization developed in the former treaties and by the court. The result is in a number of instances a historical path dependency rather than a wholesale rationalization. This tendency is visible in the treatment of exclusive external competence as it's defined in Article 2.1 TFEU. The original context in which this type of exclusivity was developed has been explained by Robert Schutzer in terms of conflict avoidance and primacy. Exclusivity is necessary where there is no clear rule of hierarchy. Conflict, which would require a rule of hierarchy to resolve, is prevented by the separation of exclusive spheres of competence. And as we've seen, the court developed the notion of exclusive external competence in the 70s at a time when the primacy of EU law with respect to member states' international agreements was uncertain, at least with regard to agreements with third countries. Now that the primacy of EU law over the member states' international agreements subject to Article 351 TFEU is established as a matter of EU law, the doctrines of shared competence, compliance, preemption and sincere cooperation in the union interest deal with the risks of conflict. Certainly, the Lisbon Treaty reproduces the limited instances of exclusivity already determined by the court's case law in Article 3.1 of the TFEU, the implied rationale being the need in these policy instances for a single set of rules established at the union level. But the seemingly clear distinction between types of competent, competence with a limited role for exclusive competence and shared competence being the default subject to preemption is complicated by one of the more ambiguous provisions introduced by the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and I don't think anybody here will be surprised uh, that I'm referring to Article 3, Paragraph 2, TFEU. At first sight, this provision appears simply to codify earlier case law on external competence, including the so-called AETR effect. However, its relationship with Article 2.2 TFEU is far from clear. How does preemption operating within shared competence under Article 2.2 TFEU 
interact with the exclusive competence derived from Article 3.2 TFEU, where an international agreement may affect common rules or alter their scope? And how do both these provisions relate to Article 2.161 TFEU, according to which the Union possesses treaty-making powers where an international agreement is likely to affect common rules or alter their scope? The treaties here certainly do not maintain a clear conceptual distinction between the existence of external competence, Article 2161, the exclusivity of that competence, Article 3.2, and the operation of legislative preemption, Article 2.2. The almost but not quite identical language of Article 2161 and Article 3.2 invite a potentially large expansion of exclusive external competence. In any event, the attempt to codify the court's case law on exclusivity has not led to greater clarity. We might say that Article 2161 renders explicit the doctrine of implied powers. It provides a clear legal basis for what is elsewhere in the treaty referred to as the external dimension of, it, of its other policies, the Union's other policies, such as competition policy, transport, energy, or social policy. It provides a general treaty-making competence where the conclusion of an agreement is necessary in order to achieve within the framework of the Union's policies one of the objectives referred to in the treaties, or is provided for in a legally binding Union Act, or is likely to affect common rules or alter their scope. The dangers, we've, I've already referred to the danger of the insufficient differentiation between this provision and Article 3.2 TFEU. We would be very far from seeing exclusive competence as the exception were we to find that in fields ranging from energy policy to criminal cooperation, the Union either has exclusive competence or no ex external competence at all. The formulation of Article 216 also impinges on the relationship between internal and external powers. The doctrine of implied powers was linked to the possession by the Union of internal powers designed to achieve a specific objective. Article 2161 refers to Union Acts in its second and third grounds of competence, but in its first and broadest, it breaks this link. No longer is there a need for the agreement to be necessary to achieve an objective for which internal powers have been provided, and which is therefore likely, though not inevitably, to be internal in orientation. All that is needed is for the objective to be referred to in the treaties, which would include the very widely drawn general external objectives of Article 21 TEU, and for the action to take place within the framework of the Union's policies. I now want to turn um, to uh, moving from the theoretical to EU practice and what I've called a certain amount of give and take in EU practice. So, in the last decade, I think we can identify two somewhat opposing tendencies. On the one hand, as we've just seen, the Lisbon Treaty attempts to clarify competences to codify the Court of Justice case law. As a result, types of competence and their implica implications should be clearer and more distinct. On the other hand, as a counterpoint to this attempt to clarify competences in the treaties, Institutional practice and also decisions of the Court of Justice have tended to undermine rigid distinctions between exclusive and shared competence in the interest of pragmatic solutions. This blurring tends to occur in the context of the exercise of competence as opposed to its existence, but this should not surprise us. Where competence is shared, decisions about its exercise, whether, when, how, become important, since the exercise by one party, EU or member state, of its competence may affect the ability of the other to exercise theirs. What I think is interesting about this practice is first that the flexibility concerns exclusive as well as shared competences, and secondly that it operates in both directions, i.e. both as reticence in insisting on the exercise of EU powers even where they're exclusive, and as willingness on the part of member states to see the EU exercise external powers alone, even where competence is shared. So the first examples are uh, concern ways in which um, the member states may continue to act alongside the EU, even where there is exclusivity. 
On several occasions in the last decade, the Council has adopted a procedural framework within which the Member States are authorised to continue to exercise a competence which has become exclusive. The first uh, of these occasions followed the Open Skies cases, in which the Court had held that certain aspects of the Air Services agreements being concluded with third countries by individual Member States fell within exclusive competence. In addition, the Court found that the ownership and control clauses in the bilateral agreements infringed Article 43 EC, now Article 49 TFEU, and there was therefore a need to renegotiate a large number of them. Since the EU was not able or willing to enter immediately into negotiations for replacement agreements, it was decided to authorise the Member States, under certain conditions, to maintain existing or even conclude new agreements. Um, the resulting regulation, which refers to the duty of cooperation, and which confirms uh, that the cooperation procedure established by the regulation is without prejudice to the division of competence between the community and the member states, uh, imposes, the regulation imposes two main types of obligation on the member states, procedural and substantive. As far as procedural obligations are concerned, the member states are to notify the commission about the start, process and conclusion of national negotiations and the conclusion of the agreement is subject to authorisation. Substantively, member states are to include in their agreements relevant standard clauses and there are several obligations requiring equal treatment of all union carriers. The Commission it will notify the member states both if it sees a likely incompatibility and if it takes a view that the negotiations are likely to undermine the objectives of community negotiations underway with, third country, with the third country concerned. Uh, the second example uh, that I'd like to refer to uh, follows um, as a consequence of Opinion 1 2003, in which the court had held that the conclusion of the Lugano Convention on Jurisdiction and the Recognition Enforcement of Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters was within the exclusive competence of the community. Two regulations were adopted in 2009, one on the law applicable to contractual and non-contractual obligations, and one on the jurisdiction and recognition of, of judgments in matrimonial matters. In both cases, their scope of application is linked to specific internal EU legislation on the same subject matter, and thus to areas of competence where an AETR effect, and therefore preemption, now Article 3.2 TFEU, applies. These regulations follow a similar procedural pattern of notification and authorisation of Member State bilateral agreements, the Commission having the option to propose negotiating guidelines or request the inclusion of specific clauses. The third example, that of bilateral investment agreements, BITS, is striking since it arises not in the context of preemption but within the exclusivity of the common commercial policy. The Lisbon Treaty both confirmed that the common commercial policy is a matter of exclusive competence and brought foreign direct investment within its scope. Bearing in mind the 1,200 existing member state bits, a regulation was adopted which authorises the member states under certain conditions to maintain, enforce and amend their existing bits and to conclude new bits while requiring them to eliminate incompatibilities between the bilateral agreements and EU law. As the preamble to the regulation recognises, it was important in the interests of legal certainty for both member states and investors to confirm the continued existence of these member state bits unless and until they can be replaced by union agreements. There are similar procedural uh, requirements of uh, notification to the Commission and uh, a link between the continued existence of these agreements and their possible replacement by a union agreement. These initiatives have been agreed between the Member States and the institutions within the legislative process and they've not yet come under the court scrutiny. There may be some question as to the extent to which the institutions should be able to reauthorise the Member States to act where competence is exclusive. On the other hand, the Air Services Regulation is designed to manage a transitional phase both the Air Services Regulation and the regulations related to civil justice, private international law, address a situation where one aspect of EU competence, which has become exclusive, uh, 
via preemption impinges on legislative fields where the union's acquis is currently limited and international agreements are likely to contain provisions falling within both exclusive and shared competence. The BITS regulation touches upon a competence which is exclusive independently of the existence of the EU acquis and might therefore be distinguished from the other two examples, but it is clearly presented as a transitional measure. The formal requirements of exclusivity may have been preserved, but the result is a highly pragmatic solution which allows both the Union and Member States to play their part while preserving an overall unity and common interest. The second example of the continuing involvement of member states is uh, the, members, the, main, the maintenance of the practice of mixed agreements, despite the widening extent of EU external powers, which cover now also the broader aspects of foreign policy in the CFSP. It is true of the wide-ranging modern partnership and association agreements with a political dimension but also of multilateral sectoral agreements, such as environmental agreements, where competence is shared. There are cases, particularly where agreements are politically important, where they represent an element in a broader policy framework towards a third country, or are seen as a significant part of the global governance of important issues, where the unity of the European Union is served not by the participation of the EU alone, even where this would be possible, but rather by the joint participation of the EU and all its member states with the powerful signal of concerted action that this sends. It's noticeable to me that the Lisbon Treaty says nothing about this very central aspect of EU external relations practice, either in the provisions dealing with the negotiation and conclusion of agreements, Article 218, TFEU, or in any other provision. The fact that a proportion of the most important external agreements are mixed is simply ignored. Although it's true that the principles underlying the union law obligations of the member states and the institutions in the context of mixed agreements are derived from the principles which appear in the treaties, in particular the principle of sincere cooperation in Article 4.3 TEU, some recognition of the phenomenon, especially at the procedural level, would have assisted transparency. However, it must be said that one of the attractions of mixed agreements for the Union and the Member States is that it may not be necessary to identify the precise delimitation of competence and that changes in the distribution of competence do not call the agreement into question. The third example, um, whereas the, other, the two examples I've just uh, mentioned focus on maintaining a role for the Member States, even where it might not be strictly necessary in legal terms, or even where EU competence is exclusive. The third example um, is of, I want to draw attention to, is of cases where the member states are happy to let the EU act alone, although competence is shared. Somewhat paradoxically, perhaps, this seems particularly to be the case in those former second and third pillars, the CFSP and the area of freedom, security and justice, where the member states are ostensibly most protective of their prerogatives. Despite, despite the clearly non-exclusive nature of CFSP competence, all international agreements concluded under CFSP powers have been concluded by the EU alone. Um, I should say admittedly that these agreements are relatively limited in character, status of forces agreements, agreements with third countries participating in EU crisis management missions, um, or on the exchange and protection of classified information where more general political or foreign policy issues are covered in broader agreements, these, as we've seen, tend to be mixed. Mixed agreements are also rare in the area of freedom, security and justice, and even agreements on sensitive issues such as migration, for example, readmission agreements, and agreements involving criminal justice are concluded by the EU alone. One specific aspect of agreements such as these requires uh, comment. The conclusion of the agreement by the EU alone does not necessarily imply that it will be implemented only or even at all by the EU. It will not infrequently be the case that competence to determine the agreement lies substantially with the Member States. Joseph Weiler in the paper referred to at the start of my lecture put forward the possibility of what he calls vertical mixity by which he means an agreement concluded by the Union alone, but which, 
Firstly, may exceed internal union competence. Second, will not have the effect of extending internal union competence. And therefore, thirdly, may be implemented by the member states and will not preempt member state competence. And we can see examples of this in practice. One can mention, um, firstly, the agreements on extradition and mutual legal assistance, which are EU agreements designed to be implemented by the member states. In the case of the uh, ag agreements on extradition and mutual legal assistance with the US, a complex relationship with pre-existing bilateral agreements of the member states was constructed. The agreement on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters between the EU and Japan defines itself as designed to establish more effective cooperation between the EU member states and Japan and refers throughout to action taken to be taken by the states. Second example would be in development cooperation, which is a shared competence, uh, but agreements with third countries on development cooperation may be concluded by the EU alone, but may then be implemented as far as matters within member state competence is concerned by the member states. And uh, one could also mention in this context um, the uh, provision in Article 207, Paragraph 6, um, on the common commercial policy, which provides that the exercise of competences conferred uh, on the EU in the field of the common commercial policy shall not affect the delimitation of competence between the Union and the member states. So, for example, the, the fact that the union may include services and intellectual property rights in a trade agreement, even in the absence of internal legislation, may mean that the, um, uh, the shared competence of the member states to act in these fields internally will not be affected, and nor will internal EU powers be extended. So, to finish, I'd like to finish by just reflecting for a few minutes on what these examples of practice tell us about the concept of unity in EU external relations and the relationship between internal and external competencies, the issues that I uh, started off with. Um, the court refers in uh, the famous PFOS case, the uh, Commission against Sweden, 24607, to the principle uh, of unity in the international representation of the Union and its member states. Union, unity, as the practice we've just been considering shows, does not depend on, nor is it guaranteed by, exclusivity, a single actor or a single voice. Shared competence is not per se inimical to unity, which is compatible not only with shared possession of competence, but with the shared exercise of competence. As Weiler has argued, mixed agreements can strengthen the framework for the conduct of external relations. The ability of the Union and its member states to operate effectively at an international level and not merely the centre at the expense of the periphery. In such a context, choices over when and how to exercise competence become very important. The focus shifts from defining the exclusionary effects of competence to defining the scope of application of EU law i.e. the space within which EU law constrains the member states in the exercise of their competences. These constraints include both obligations of compliance with substantive EU law rules, such as non-discrimination or freedom of establishment, and procedural obligations. Both are required to manage overlapping and shared competences, and both are ultimately based on the duty of sincere cooperation. It is important that the duty to cooperate, as interpreted by the court, ensures that the union interest is protected even where competence is not exclusive. As Christoph Hillion says, this cooperation jurisprudence suggests a growing acceptance by the court of the plurality of, that characterizes the EU system of external relations. However, the key role played by the duty of sincere cooperation in managing the exercise of competence creates its own difficulties. The same provision, Article 4.3 of the TEU now, is used as a legal basis for the primacy of EU law, for exclusivity, for preemption, and to define the parameters within which member states may exercise their own competence to act. <clears throat> 
The precise nature of the duty in these different situations is not always clear, and this leads to the distinction between them being blurred. One aspect of the duty of cooperation concerns the management of ongoing joint participation in multilateral agreements and organisations where the EU and member states continue to act side by side as parties or members. The duty of cooperation is the applicable principle, but how should we define the nature of this duty so that it is effective in furthering the union interest and still ensures that both EU and member state powers are respected? And here, of course, uh, we consider, we come back to consider the PFOS case. The court here argued on the basis that preemption had not occurred, that competence was still shared, and that the issue concerned rather how that competence is exercised. Once the EU has decided how to act, the court said the member states cannot depart from this, even where no legislative preemption has taken place. For a member state to act unilaterally, disassociating itself from a concerted common strategy within the Council, and I'm quoting at this point, is likely to compromise the principle of unity in the international representation of the Union and its member states and weaken their negotiating power with regard to the other parties to the Convention. And this, the Court found, was a breach of what is now Article 4.3 TEU. And the question, of course, which many uh, commentators have, have uh, posed is whether the court is here introducing a kind of de facto exclusivity under another name. The case certainly shows the difficulties that arise where there are no clear rules, especially in deciding at what point the member states become free to act alone because there is no EU position, and the difficulty of deciding is wh whether the situation is one of no decision or a decision not to act. Under what circumstances must the member states refrain from acting, except through or in accordance with positions adopted by the union? And under what circumstances is it necessary for a union objective to which member state loyalty is owed under Article 4.3 to be formulated through a formal act adopted on an identified legal basis? There is also the problem of finding a way to present a common position of the EU and the member states, especially the collective position of the member states, which was exacerbated by the removal in the Lisbon Treaty of a formal role for the rotating presidency in foreign affairs. This was an attempted simplification of the international representation of the Union, but instead um, created more difficulties. And, uh, I'd like to make a reference to the, the Council's agreement um, of uh, uh, October 2011 uh, on representation of EU positions in multilateral organisations. I'm not going to go uh, say more about that, but I think it's an interesting example of, a, of, a, of, an, of an attempt to work out in practice who should be uh, speaking for the Union. And it's interesting in this um, uh, development of, of the concept of a so-called EU actor uh, or EU actors which can refer either to the President of the European Council, to the Commission, to the High Representative, to EU delegations um, and tries to arrive at a pragmatic solution to the question of who is to represent the common positions of the Union and the Member States. One would hope that this is a, intended to be a pragmatic um, solution to a problem, and one would hope that as a result, issues of representation should not get submerged in discussions of competence allocation. But it, it could well mean that in practice, in order to decide who will speak, the presidency, the commission, the high representative, decisions need to be taken over whether an issue is member state competence or EU competence, but not CFSP or CFSP competence. Um, I'd like to move now finally to the, uh, and, and I realize that time is, time is moving on, but um, just to finally move to the question of internal, to come back to the question of internal and external policies and the union interest. 
Going back to Article 3.2 TFEU, each of the three alternative conditions for exclusivity is linked to internal powers, power conferral by internal legislation, the external agreement is necessary in order to exercise an internal competence, the agreement may affect common rules or alter their scope. In both the Open Skies cases and Opinion 194, the court argued that the EU could achieve the objectives of the internal market by adopting internal legislation and that there was therefore no legal necessity for EU external action. These, these cases suggest an essential dependence of external action on the prior development of internal policy in the tradition of AETR. We can also see that the union interest that is to be protected in cases of exclusivity or legislative preemption is essentially an internal one. It is free movement and undistorted competition within the internal market, opinion 175, or more generally, the unity of the common market and the uniform application of community law, the full effectiveness of community law, phrases from opinion 103. There is a need to protect not only an existing internal acquis, but also the development of policy in the future. The court uh, makes a reference to this in opinion 103, um, saying that it is necessary to take into account not only the current state of community law in the area in question, but also its future development. Where member states are authorised to act in situations of exclusive EU competence, uh, the examples that I've just been considering, they need to take future policy plans into account. And both the BITS cases and the PFOS case illustrate in different ways that the duty of cooperation operating in a context of shared competence requires the member states to preserve the possibility of future EU action. As we've seen, the duty of cooperation in the service of the union interest is presented as a guiding principle for union and member states. But how do we define the union interest? It becomes easier to do so if a common position has already been adopted in the context of internal policy debate. Furthermore, and in pragmatic terms, and especially in cases of shared competence, if there is an agreed position internally, then it's easier to present a united position externally, even through several actors or voices. These are reflections of Robert Post's argument that links external unity with a need to safeguard the results of deliberation in the internal agora. The PFOS case is a good example. The council was clear that it did not want to move ahead externally to ban PFOS more quickly than it was moving at an internal level. The court enforced this decision by the council through the duty of cooperation, insisting that it bound the member states in loyalty. This is not a point about the existence of competence, but rather about practice, i.e. the choice of whether to exercise competence or not in a particular case. Thus, despite more explicit external powers in the treaties and despite the loosening of the ties between internal and external powers that we find in Article 216, the need for formation of policy at the internal level is still important. Is external action then merely a means to achieve internal objectives? Where does this leave the specifically external objectives of Article 21 to TEU and the development of an external competence which is somehow autonomous of internal policy making? And does it mean that external action will always somehow lag behind internal policy making? We need to nuance the picture in several ways. Firstly, the broad external powers granted under Articles for example, 207, the, C the Common Commercial Policy, 208 and 212, Development Cooperation and Economic Cooperation, 217, Association Agreements, the CFSP, leave plenty of room for the development of a distinctive external identity for the Union with its own agenda and policy formation structures and explicit external objectives. Secondly, as we've seen, the EU may wish to negotiate a position externally without having yet enacted internal legislation, leaving open the question of implementation and allowing a dynamic development of EU policy and external competences. The use of mixity allows that development to be reflected in the operation of an ongoing international agreement. Thirdly, where an international agreement does break new ground for the EU, it may prove a trigger for the development of new internal legislation, 
and I'm thinking here just one example, the passenger name records agreements, um, firstly with the US and later with uh, other countries, including Australia. Um, the Commission having proposed an, a, a directive on PNR to establish an equivalent internal PNR regime. So, to conclude, there is no single federal model out, out there for the con conduct of external relations. Nevertheless, as, as Weiler points out, it's not uncommon for federal systems to limit the exercise of external powers to the federal entity and to accept that it has external powers which go beyond the federal internal legislative competence. We have seen that the EU shows signs of this phenomenon too, the development initially by the court, later enshrined in the treaties of exclusivity, the fact that conclusion of an agreement by the EU does not necessarily imply that it will implement it internally. That may be a matter for member state competence. But there are several ways in which the EU does not conform to this particular federal model. Firstly, external competence as a whole has not been definitively transferred to the Union. Its external competence is still limited by the principle of conferral. Although, if we look at the broad scope of its specifically external competences, including the CFSP, together with the potentiality of Article 216, it is difficult to establish real limits to union competence. But there is less evidence, especially in practice, of a real exclusionary effect on the competence of the member states. It is increasingly difficult to identify distinct and limited fields of competence occupied by the Union and Member States respectively. Instead, these competences overlap. Even where EU competence is formally exclusive, the Union may decide to reauthorise the Member States to act, subject to procedural and substantive con constraints to ensure protection of the Union interest. Shared external competence has become the norm and ways have to be found to ensure, within the scope of union action, unity, loyalty, and the defense of the union interest. So the focus is on constraining the exercise of competence rather than its existence, although the constraints may be severe. Secondly, the link between internal and external competence is still strong in the union. The union is directed to pursue its general external objectives when developing and implementing the external dimension of its internal policies. External instruments are used to serve objectives that have an essentially internal focus. Preemption and exclusivity are based on the adoption of legislation requiring external unity to safeguard the internal acquis. As a matter of practice rather than doctrine, the union is more likely to choose to exercise its competence externally and is perhaps more likely to be able to formulate a common external position where a policy has already been formulated internally. It is in the interaction between formal rules and practice that innovative solutions are found for the very specific type of system that is the EU as an international actor. I've tried today to illustrate some of this practice, including some creative responses, but also demonstrating some of the tensions inherent between the Union and the Member States, each with the capacity to undertake international obligations. The Member States willing to see the Union engage effectively internationally, but also wary of the impact of that action on their own internal and external autonomy. The Union's institutions defending its hard-won internal and external acquis and its sense of a common interest, as well as their own prerogatives and place in the institutional system. It is to be hoped that the attempt in the revised treaties to redact 40 years of legal development and practice into definitive rules governing competence will not inhibit the continuing search for a pragmatic balance between the different actors and institutions that play their parts in the competence space of the European Union's external relations system. Thank you.